Since maintaining racial boundaries is important for the ruling class to maintain power, one of the ways they've tried to justify these divisions is by using science. Science by itself doesn't have any morality. It's all in how we use it. As you might imagine, how we've used science to look at human classification has usually fallen on the pretty racist side. One of my favorite opening sentences to any textbook ever is this one. The study of human biological diversity is challenging and has been historically fraught with controversy. If you'd like to read more, this is um, from Human Biological Variation by Milky, Konigsberg, and Relaford. Really, what we're talking about is something called scientific racism. This is the attempt to justify racial boundaries by using science, and it generally leads to discrimination. Most of these studies are conducted by people who have this preconceived idea that these racial boundaries are true, and they are merely trying to justify the beliefs they already have. This is called a confirmation bias. Um, and when we're looking at this, there's a couple of threads that you might notice. Um, something that goes all the way back to Greek philosophers. Here's the four temperaments from Hippocrates and Galen. Um, so here we have um, red or blood, the sanguine temperament. Then we have the yellow or choleric. Then we have black, melancholy, um, blue or phlegmatic. And these are something we see uh, reflected even in modern culture today. Um, and when we see different colors associated with different uh, people or things. Um, we see it in our Power Rangers. We have our black Power Ranger and our yellow Power Ranger. Thanks, progress. Um, we also see our red Power Ranger here as Jason, so not as obviously uh, racially coded, but remember we also have our pink Power Ranger, so problems with feminism as well. Um, but let's talk a little bit more about specific human classification. Starting with Linnaeus, he came out with a Systema Natura in the 1700s, where he um, tried to classify all of the different living species. Um, in this first edition, he actually classified um, chimpanzees and orangutans into the same species within the same genus as us in Homo troglodytes. There's a couple other Homo species that he included, Homo caudatus, Homo monstrosus, Homo nocturnus, Homo lucifer. Yeah, that one's devils. Um, so you can see some of these, these are about monsters or demons. In the early versions of Linnaeus' classification system, he didn't quite get the difference between real things and imaginary things. And many of these were fairly quickly removed. Um, but let's look at how he classified humans. He actually had four different subspecies of humans. So Homo sapiens africanus, americanus, asiaticus, and europaeus. So here these are broadly reflecting different continents. So we have our Africans, our Native Americans, our Asians, and our Europeans. Um, he also had these two other subspecies here, Homo sapiens ferus and Homo sapiens monstrosus. Um, ferus means feral children, so apparently if you're brought up by wolves, you're a different subspecies. Um, and monstrosus refers to people with body modification. So there's definitely a little bit of cultural horror there. Um, but after Linnaeus, we had someone called Johann Friedrich Blum Blumenbach in the late 1700s and early 1800s. Um, and he is considered the father of physical anthropology. He looked at Linnaeus' system and very quickly he threw out some things. So Homo sapiens, ferus, and monstrosus, not real. And he has also removed chimpanzees from our genus and put them in a separate genus. Um, and noting that they are significantly different, so they deserve to be in different places in the classification. He also denoted five races rather than Linnaeus's four, but he specifically said for the sake of convenience. Um, and he called them Ethiopian, American, Asian, Caucasian, and Malayan. Um, here it might be easy to look at some skulls to help back this up. His view was that there was one that was closest to the original, 
of course, the Caucasian or European skull here. And then in either direction, we are moving in extremes away from this closest to original. So here, this is the view that the European or white people are the most pure or closest to God. Um, one thing that was unusual that Johann Frederick Blumenbach did is rather than look at stereotypes, he did his best to befriend um, scholars or notable people in these different cultures. And he tried to be as respectful as possible, and he did a lot better than most other people in his day. Um, so here we have uh, Feridor Iwanowicz, um, a Mongolian painter. We have Thayan Denega, a Mohawk leader and diplomat. Um, we have Yusuf Effendi, an Ottoman ambassador. Um, we have Homai, a Tahitian celebrity. Um, and then we have um, Captain Jacob Joseph Eliza, an Ethiopian clergyman. Um, so he is being a little bit more respectful and he is drawing his interpretations from leaders of these people rather than simply uh, going immediately to stereotypes. Um, one thing that I do find amusing from Blumenbach is he did know that human groups are impossible to separate by any but very arbitrary limits. He also said that individual Africans differ as much or even more from other Africans as from Europeans. What's interesting is these uh, no, uh, observations still hold up today and closely match a lot of the data that we're seeing from genetic evidence, and yet he still made different races. So Blumenbach was a little bit hypocritical in this point, and though some of his viewpoints were a little bit ahead of his time. Our next person to talk about is Georges Cuvier, obviously a Frenchman. Um, he was famous for comparative anatomy. He also had a theory called catastrophism, when we talk, which we'll talk about in evolution. He saw only three races. He called them African, European, European and Asian. One of the things that people were debating at this time was called monogenism versus polygenism. These words are a little bit of a mouthful, so let's break them up into their component parts. Mono is of course single or one, and poly is many. Genism here, that is origin. So people are arguing, is there a single origin to all humans or were there many origins? And really the debate here is, are these racial characteristics that people were observing fixed or were they easily changeable? Monogenists, they viewed them as changeable because if there is a single origin for all humans, then obviously these differences were relatively recent and um, reflect that humans are changeable. Polygenists, who viewed that there were multiple independent origins of different groups of humans, they viewed these racial characteristics as permanent and as fundamental differences between different groups. In the 1800s, we're starting to see more and more transitions to scientific studies of race, or at least attempts to do so. Um, and we're seeing more and more incorporation of measurements and data. Two of the measurements we're using at this time are the cephalic index and the cranial capacity. Cranial capacity is just how big your brain is. Um, usually this was determined by uh, after death. So you take a skull and um, usually at this time they would like fill it with grain or something that they could fill it up and then measure after they dump it out uh, from the skull. Um, cephalic index, that is something you can measure on a living person. Here we're trying to get an idea of the shape of your skull. So you measure the length versus the width, and then you can get an index. So is the head kind of round? Is the head long? Is it wide? We're looking at those types of shape differences. Someone who pioneered some of this research was Samuel George Morton. Um, he was a physician and natural historian, but he was obsessed with human crania. He had one of the most impressive uh, collections of human crania from as many different um, types of people as he could procure. Um, he saw four different races, European, Asian, Native American, and African. Next, we have Franz Boa. So now we're finally getting into the 1900s. Franz Boas did an interesting thing, and he looked at the cephalic index, and he compared people who were born in the U.S. and recent immigrants for many different um, different peoples coming to the US. And he clearly showed 
that the cephalic index isn't fixed and it changed a lot within one of these groups, whether they were born in the US or where they were born somewhere else. So this clearly shows that the cephalic index is affected by the environment and is not a fixed characteristic of any of these groups. Um, even more recently, um, there have been several statistical techniques people try and use, one of them which is k-means clustering. Um, and this is just a modern statistical method. You have a bunch of data points and you're trying to cluster them. The key here is you have to know how many clusters you have. So you have uh, n different data points and you put them into k clusters, but again, you have to know how many clusters in advance. So here's an example. Maybe this is our data, but we know already that we have three different groups. So you put this into your computer and it will tell you something like this. Here are your three different clusters. People have been trying to use similar methods to look at human genetic variation and to try and determine how many different groups we have. Here you can see they've gone and tried K of two, K of three, K of four, K of five, and up to K of six to try and figure out which one is the best representation for how many different groups or races we have in humans. And you can see, um, depicted by these colors here, there's a group of, you know, uh, mostly orange, a group of mostly blue, a group of mostly purple or mostly pink. The problem is, remember, this method is dependent on knowing how many clusters in advance, and it will tell you what the clusters are. K-means clustering is not a good method to discover what those clusters are. Um, this is an interesting way to see mixed ancestry when you're looking at human genetic data, but it isn't a great way if you're trying to discover the number of races. Um, it is interesting to point out the U.S. Census and how that is classified. Um, the U.S. Census actually differentiates between race and ethnicity. So race is identification of a social group. Um, they include white, black, African, um, Asian, American Indian, or Alaskan Native, or Native Hawaiian, or other Pacific Islander, and of course the very useful other category. Um, and ethnicity is the difference between being Hispanic or not. If you haven't noticed this already, nobody really agrees on how many different groups or races there are within humans. And it's a social construct. We'll go more into this when we look at evolution and how human diversity is patterned. But what we can see is that nobody agrees and it is not easy to, to pick apart how many different groups there are in humans and really different things are going on. Remember, race is a relatively recent concept with the goal of cementing um, economic incentives for the ruling class. It is a way to maintain power and control over everyone else. Remember, black lives do matter. And it's important to understand this because we wanna understand our blind spots because that will allow us to identify and hopefully dismantle our unconscious biases. So, is there a consensus on how humans differ? But even more importantly, is human biological meaning, variation meaningful? And can you explain how?